when the next extreme happens, and this is what I'd be looking for, uh, as you know, if you know what the real estate cycle is, you are looking for um, 14 years up off the lows of the US real estate, which was back in the back in the beginning years of the prior decade. So you know, we're now looking towards 2026, 2027 for things to start to, to look interesting. One of the things that I'm most interested as an investor is sleeping peacefully at night. Now, that's all not always easier said than done, but um, since finding Akil and Phil's work, it has really helped me. Now, one of the things that I'm super grateful for is you guys have gone and done the hard work of looking at 200, 250 years worth of data in the American markets in terms of the previous economic cycles, booms and busts. And so my question today for today's video is what's coming over the next six to 10 years and how can investors like myself or yourselves, you know, safely set themselves up to take advantage of whatever potential growth is coming around the world, but also knowing that at some point in the next 10 years, there's probably going to be a pretty hard market to, to move through as well. Big question, loaded question, but let's just sort of tackle it a moment by moment. Uh, Akil, you want to you want to jump in? <laughs> I mean, I've got, I've got, me personally, I actually don't think it's that hard to see what's coming next. I know that sounds a little bit facetious. But, you call it but, remembering me, the future, right? Because you've yeah. learned from the past. Yes. So let me describe it this way. Number one, get educated. You, you have to get some sort of understanding. The best way to do that is to understand the real estate cycle and how it's constructed. In other words, it's based, about, based around the enclosure of the economic rent. If, uh, if, if, uh, if someone doesn't understand that, if you don't understand it, uh, I urge that, that person just spend a little bit, little bit of time and get educated on that. It is the best thing you'll ever do because, as as Ben, as you've discovered, uh, it gives you the structure of how the economy works. Once you get that structure, I know from all the people I've taught before and Akil's been speaking with and taught as well, you can sleep better at night. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I actually yes. legitimately sleep better at night yeah. <laughs> like I do. <laughs> yes, because you can see what the structure is. It allows you to see through uh, the economy uh, and see through, especially see through the bullshit that we get from politicians and government. Uh, absolutely. I, I really sincerely mean that. They, they lead you down the wrong track through through emotive and emotional behavior. And there was no better example than that than Donald Trump. You know, he was telling people how great he was right at the top. You can't get suckered into that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the things are often uh, they don't appear what they really are. So let me give you an example of that at the moment, just for the next year or two. Long bond yields, uh, they're, they're going to rise a little bit uh, at the moment, and they, they have and they are already. I don't get sucked into the belief that they're rising. They're not actually rising. I'd like to put that in a slightly different technical term. They're retracing the down move. They have to rise a little bit. And in that environment where yield curves, and again, if, if, if any anybody watching or listening doesn't understand what the yield curve is, Get educated. It's not hard. Uh, it only takes a little bit, a couple of minutes of elbow work. And, and you know, it, with our members and subscribers, we do that for them, as you know, when you've been getting our stuff. We Can do, I just point out something there really important to people that haven't been following you as long as I have? You mentioned that there was going to be the inversion in the yield curve. I think it was almost 18 months ago. Yeah. And you yeah. said that with every inversion within nine months, there's almost been a technical or deep recession for yeah. 100 years. Now, yeah. The yield curve is so simple, and I'm I'm nowhere near as quick as you guys are on this stuff. It's when the long-term bond and the short-term bond meet, and yes. there's an inversion point, and you know it's just a, a precursor of yes. in the past something that's coming. Now that happened, I sort of thought, well, everyone freaking knows about the yield curve thing, and because of that, there's not going to be a recession. And like clockwork, with almost nine months to the day, it worked out. So yeah. it is powerful information that's super easy for people to learn about. You can read it on your website in about two minutes and get it. That's right. Now we've got the opposite. Now we've got a bit of a steepening, uh, which means that uh, it's a bit easier for banks um, to make money, which is what the governments and the federal 
uh, what the Fed wants, they, because at the end of the day, they now want more lending and more credit creation. So now that might lead to some people in the stock market panicking a little bit because they'll say, oh, if, if yields are rising, it might mean the stock market sells off. But just for the next year or two, we're in a position where where the, the yield curve is steepening, but provided, and this is usually the case, when we're coming out of a uh, some sort of downturn or recession, uh, earnings of listed companies will increase more than the yield does, which uh, in the end is bullish for stock markets, and that's what markets are pricing in at the moment. So you'd expect over the next little while yields to retrace a bit, uh, but earnings to increase, and that'll hold up valuations. That's the next uh, year or two out. Then I think after that, we'll get pretty serious with uh, the infrastructure kicking in. We've got to build more. You'll start to see talk about tallest buildings and and uh, lots more roads and rail, and uh, and uh, and especially in America, what, why they why they they've got it's a first world country with a third world uh, infrastructure service and a, and a fourth world healthcare system. Everybody outside mm-hmm. America knows that. So Biden's now got a chance to improve that. That's very bullish as well. In, in the Commonwealth Bank update in Australia, just from the Australian perspective too, just came out and said that 2% of the GDP is going to go into infrastructure. And Commonwealth Bank's words, are, this will create the biggest boom in Australian history if they follow through on their word, which it's almost 100% guarantee that they're going to. Like I've never, ever seen something come from ComBank talking about a government-driven infrastructure boom. They reckon unemployment rates are going to be below 5% in Australia within 18 months off the back of what they're doing at the moment. Yes. Now, that that um, then after that, and uh, we are extrapolating a little bit here, you know, uh, years into the future, but again, you just extrapolate years into the past and that'll tell you what the future is going to do. And of course, uh, you know, if you've read my Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking book, which which details the prior 11 cycles. Uh, you need to print a bunch more of those books to be as well, to be honest. They're bloody hard to find. I've, I reckon I've had two or 300 clients spend over 100 bucks, go find them. I'm putting a Phil, it's well, time to get some more printed out there. Let's do it. <laughs> the publisher is Shepard Walwyn. They've got quite a few on hand, so if you just go directly to the publisher, they should be cool. Should be pretty easy. But I'll look into it. You might have noticed that certainly the, almost the last thirty years, in a way, since 1982 or 1983, perhaps longer, after most downturns, the um, banks around the world, governments around the world, have been able to get away with lowering interest rates a lot, and that's all good. When the next extreme happens, and this is what I'd be looking for. Uh, as you know, if you know what the real estate cycle is, you are looking for um, 14 years up off the lows of the U.S. real estate, which was back in the back in the beginning years of the prior decade. So, you know, we're now looking towards 2026, 2027 for things to start to, to look interesting. If that does happen, then to get a sustained downturn after that extreme, uh, it always, always comes back to um, rising interest rates, really. So you'd have to be on guard because after 2026, if we do start to see a bit of a sell-off and a bit of a downturn, you know, the, the banks and the government, they're going to do what they always do. They'll try to lower interest rates. How, uh, how can time, they do that at the moment? Like by 2026, where do you forecast rates could be for re- retail investors like myself? It be much, I don't think it'll be much different than what it is now. Perhaps uh, I don't. It's relative. I don't get, I don't get, try not to get hung up on the, the actual precise number. Things are relative, so it'll be relative to inflation and relative to expectations and things. So um, they might be pulling them back from a 5%, for example, back down to a rate relative to now to try and get us through the next one type thing, just theoretically. Yeah. Well, that's that's the theory and that's the textbook stuff and it's possible. But two things. The debts are now... I've never worried about debts before. I've always said to people, you don't have to worry about debt till everybody else does, and that usually happens, as we know from the real estate cycle, about every 18 years. They are significant now, and uh, it is something we should – they're just uh, – well, I've never seen them, so so it's unprecedented, really. And even that's How, household debt or government debt globally? All debt. Debt everywhere. Yeah. Debt everywhere. So the thing – will be the only trouble will happen if there's an event or two that does not permit either the United States, especially the United States or other countries, 
from actually being able to lower rates. And one of those events that could stop the US government from having the ability to lower rates is if they got a currency crisis, whereby they that's when the US might be considered a third world country or like what a third world country is, where they have to keep raising rates to, to protect uh, the currency or to protect the, the lowering dollar or to protect whatever currency it is. And uh, things start to get out of hand that way. So just, I don't know what the event will be. I, you know, um, I just know the timing on it. You'd have to start to look for something. But if you get, if we get to a situation where for some particular reason, the event that takes place makes it, starts to make it really hard for the government or the Fed to be able to lower rates like they really do, that's when you could see a panic. And that's possible after 2026, yeah. Worry about that if it happens. Yes. So from, talking, you know, what I've talking, seen from you well, guys, you're sort of saying, you know, 2021 is hopefully the start of a recovery. We get to about 2023, 2024, and we might move to almost like a bit of a winner's curse phase of the cycle. And then historically, but, you know, again, these things can be one to two years either way based on, you know, history and reading your book. So, 2026 would be a point where you'd be sort of suggesting that people are in a semi-stable position to be able to weather a bit of a storm if if one's going to come through. Well, I, I could, <laughs> as you know, I could go on about this for hours. But um, I think I think what just laid out for you is um, the framework. So, uh, and you notice how nowadays, if you're reading the news, to hyperinflation and you know, it's just not sustainable and so on. And we're saying, well, what you really should be focusing on is increasing company earnings, which is why the stock market is increasing. At the peak of the cycle, we will have all sort of somehow convinced ourselves that this thing is going to go on forever. And we'll be saying the opposite. We'll be saying, well, you know, actually look out for a, a trigger event that might, you know, make everyone sort of wake up to the amount of debt that there is, how high land prices are, how overextended things are. So um, I think to, to go back to your original question, Ben, the, the point is that if you study history, you can develop this framework. It's relatively simple when you get down to it. So just about following how the yield curve moves, what's going on in the land market, um, what's happening with inflation, Printed to acquire real estate, and so and it's not just governments that print money. It's also the private banking system does that as well. When's that gone over the top? And when it has, you know that uh, you are ready for some kind of correction. And it's at that point that you want to be, make sure that you can weather the storm. You might have cash on hand. Um, you are not uh, over leveraged. If your you know some of your rental income. Uh, went down, you still could service your debts. You wouldn't be forced to sell in a in a um, in a bearish market when things aren't looking good, because obviously then you'd be forced to sell at a low price. You just have to do relatively simple things. But the key the key piece of knowledge that you need is to understand the structure of the real estate cycle, as Phil said, uh, and it's laid out very clearly in his book, The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking. And he takes you through the history for the entire history of the United States. Uh, sets out each cycle. He gives you the framework at the end. I'm also uh, writing a book. Hopefully, it will be published this year, uh, where I, you know, I basically kind of copy what Phil said. Um, <laughs> saying, this, the cycle. Uh, this is what uh, this is what you're doing. Uh, this is what you should be looking for, and this is what um, this is what you should do about it. So, some some practical information as well. Now, you're going to be doing. Um the Fred Harrison thing with that book and sort of pointing towards 2026 20, and making a forecast that you can put your hat on for the next 70 years of your life? Or are you are you not being that bullish and just putting it all on the line? Ah, uh, no, I will. I mean, I've been I've been writing about this stuff for, you know, sort of five or six. I think actually the first time I wrote about it was with Phil. We did a Money Week article in London uh, in 2014. Uh, we put it out all online then, so uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know if I if we're wrong, we're wrong, and we're you know. But but 
if we are wrong, that means that something has fundamentally changed about the economy. The thing is, and guys, at any point s- you could be wrong. Like I'm playing devil's advocate here, but I'm a, I'm a cynic and a skeptic, the same as you guys both are. There's a healthy level there. The only thing that would be wrong is the, the dates, right? Like, you know, the whole structure is still the same. People do really, really silly stuff when they don't understand the flow of money into assets long term. And at some point, it's always going to go over a top because human nature just cannot help itself. Uh, Ben, sorry, Akil, I just cut in a bit. But um, the one thing I learned from writing my book, I've said this before, the the one thing I learned, which uh, is giving me the confidence to say such things in public, the one thing I learned is things happened and things had to happen to make the real estate cycle uh, complete and finish. And uh, we are seeing this at the moment. Despite interest rates being so low, the debts have risen to astronomic proportions. So only one more thing has to happen, really. And as we go forward into 2026, the time frame we're looking at, things have to happen to bring absolutely everybody into the, into the stock market and at the top for people to have absolutely no cash left because they're so heavily invested. Mm-hmm. And, and look around you, what's happening? Robin Hood, people getting, people getting feeling as though they've missed out on, on stuff. There's the newspaper's full of the, the prodigious $100 million gains that they've made. We've got a lot of new investors in, in the crypto area, which is an area that, uh, it, you know, that nobody really is a specialist in. Anything's possible. Anything's possible. Imagine if imagine if Bitcoin goes to a million bucks. I'm, I'm not saying it will. Okay. I mean, you know, imagine the 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 the, the aura and the, what goes into the media about this. And then remember, then because the, the real estate cycle structure teaches you, at the top is when things look at their absolute best. Mm-hmm. But underneath the, the structure is when it's at, at its absolute weakest because everything's built on credit and nobody's got any cash left because we're all in. We're absolutely all in. And then the final thing that will complete the whole structure, and I don't wish to be sinister here, but but history's proved it, governments, the, the Fed, central bankers around the world, if, if there's something happening behind the scenes that might be revealing the weaknesses in the structure, they will do absolutely everything to make sure it doesn't become public. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing, see? That's why you have to know the structure and you have to know your history. I love that, mm-hmm. Phil. You know, one one. One question. Actually, there's two things I wanted to say that, if you don't mind, like that I heard literally today. So one of them was from my auntie. She's just booked one of the penthouses for her birthday in the Gold Coast. Now this this place, which was the world's tallest apartment in Australia in 2007, it opened up, sold for 9.5 million dollars. Just just resold in 2021 for 5.6 million dollars. You know. 40% loss over 12 years plus no effective gains. Like that's just, it was just another perfect example of don't buy the hype because mm. um, they've just announced like three three of the tallest buildings in Australia have just all been announced in Melbourne for to open up in 2027. Um, you know, literally all of them have been fast-tracked to get us out of COVID and to create jobs. You know, that was interesting. The second thing that I heard was an investor from Sydney – You know, because I've heard you guys talk about um, the satellite cities around Europe, America and Australia, which, you know, seem to do better in the second half of the cycle. I've seen Sydney and Melbourne prices run up by 80% in the last 10 years, but prices in Brisbane and Perth are legitimately cheaper to buy than they were 10 to 12 years ago right now. I'm sure there's cities in the UK the same, and I'm sure there's cities in the States the same as well. Sydney Investor gets on the phone this morning to an agent that we know, this house was online for 590k, sold for $800,000, and the guy said, "Is that enough?" And the agent was like, "Yeah, that's enough. 600k would have been enough, but he's not going to tell the guy from Sydney that doesn't know the Brisbane market that." And so that creates a new standard in the suburb, and this is like the cycle legitimately turning in front of everybody's eyes right now. Like it's as clear as day. You always said that there's a new technological invention, which is clearly cryptocurrency, where you guys are starting to call that mining, you know, because effectively it's a new resource in a way. And there's going to be an unprecedented amount of people that make money there. Mm. Some of them will be smart enough to pull it out and put it into something else, stock markets or properties. And, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's just really cool. So my last question will be, what specifically with your own money 
are you guys going to be investing and what's your asset allocation going to be between property, business and prop, um, and stock markets over the next five to six years to take advantage mm. of this stuff? Because that's the question that so many people have out there. How much do I do? What do I do? You know, who cares what we're trying to do? What are you guys actually going to do with your with your hard-earned money over the next five years? Well, I mean, I think we, you know, we've said in a previous video that you kind of go for things that you know well. I mean, investing is not a business where you basically just stick your money in something and, you know, you know, five years later, it will suddenly <laughs> no. magically have... Uh, increased. I mean, you know, there are some stories like that, but you don't, I mean, there's not much credibility behind them and it's not very common. Um, so the answer to your question really is there's no sort of pre-programmed allocation. You know, we are, what we're saying to you, to you and your listeners is that there are going to be many opportunities along a whole host of asset classes from commodities to real estate to stocks to cryptocurrency You've got to know what you're doing. You've got to study it. You've got to understand, you know, how to buy and sell and what to buy and sell. So you would uh, recommend people off. stay in their circle of influence and actually specialize in a couple of things that they're going to take advantage of over the next five years? Yeah, I mean, oh, they can expand it to more than a couple of things, but they should. I think you mentioned off air that uh, you were going to learn how to, you know, the stock market works. Uh, and focus there. I mean, that's exactly the approach you take. You know, you've, you understand real estate very well. You want to diversify some of your earnings uh, and your investment returns. So you learn about the stock market. We've uh, covered some of the areas which you might want to look for uh, as a stock market investor. Uh, and that's exactly the way you do it. I mean, personally, I mean, I, I don't mind saying that, um, you know, I invest in real estate. I, of course, um, invest in the stock market. Uh, I'm. I don't know much about cryptocurrency except sort of theoretically. But I mean, there's all sorts of coins being traded and exchanged. I mean, I think I might try and learn a bit about that because it seems that whereas you know the stock market gives you nice patient returns of about uh, you know if you're if you're doing well 20 20 percent a year. I mean, cryptocurrency can give you 20 percent in a week. So uh, <laughs> it seems sort of fairly at the moment. So, uh, yeah, at the moment, yes. You know, who knows where it will go? Maybe Bitcoin will, as Phil just said, go to a million dollars. And uh, if it does, there will be um, wall-to-wall coverage in the financial press about how, you know, so-and-so person was earning sort of a thousand dollars a month uh, in in January 2021 and is now a, a crypto billionaire or something. <laughs> uh, I think uh, cryptocurrency. His name's makes- his name's a kill. <laughs> he, he wrote a book on property, yeah. but he didn't publish it because he was doing so good in crypto. <laughs> yes. We published uh, in the blockchain. <laughs> um, and so, you know, there are, it's, I mean, I, I would also, I mean, just to go back a little bit to the point, um, we'd be wrong or where might things slightly differ in terms of timing. I mean, I think the 1920s is a good example. And people have started to compare uh, the two decades and, um, you know, it is possible that there's so much money that goes into the markets over the next five years that things get extended a little bit. Maybe the real estate market doesn't have a really strong final couple of years, but the stock market does. You know, you, you might get something like that. Maybe the fact that China will be probably by the middle of the decade quite clearly and widely acknowledged the biggest economy in the world might change things slightly because, you know, the Chinese government has a bit more of a hold on what people and businesses can do um so and there's always going to be something uh, that um makes things appear different and it's when people have are convinced that we're wrong that i think will be uh the most correct can i say something before you answer your part of your question phil um something you both said to me in this video is people being all in and so in australia right now Australians have saved $125 billion of additional household savings on top of their normal. They've taken $35 billion out in super that has yet to be put back into the economy. And then you've got the Australian government printing legitimately hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, people aren't all in yet. And yeah. I think that's an, you know, that's an important distinction that I think you guys have made because you're sort of suggesting that as we get close to the top of the cycle, 
people are going to be scratching around for anything they can to get the money into wherever's making the shortest and easiest and largest return in the hope that it's just going to be like the people they talked to three years ago that, that did it three years ago at a better time. Yes, <clears throat> yes. Uh, ben, it's pretty easy for me. I'll be looking for the, the best breaks in the best stocks in the best stock market and I'll be telling all my members and subscribers all about it. The best Please stock market being the States at the moment still from I, your perspective? If Australia breaks into the – if Australia charges into new highs, uh, it would be pretty good for Australia. Awesome, mate. Yeah. Um, is there anything else either of you guys wanted to round out the conversation with here? Get educated, all right? Get educated. Tell your people. You, uh, I tell mine all the time. Just get ed- educated. Understand what the structure of the economy is. You do that by studying land. The secret life of real estate and banking, guys, yes. subscribing to um, Property Share Market Economics yes. newsletter yes. or even, you know, programs that you guys offer. Is there any other reading? I know you love Gann. I know that you and Fred Harrison have a relationship as well. Is there anyone yes. else they should be checking out that's worth having a look at? Yeah, Akil's book coming soon. Definitely. Will, will they be able to pick that up, Akil? Like, and when will that be published? Yes, yeah, so the the book will be out hopefully in October or September this year. Um, I've yet to have <laughs> fun, should we say. Um, it's going to be published by Harriman House and it'll be available on their website or uh, as both a physical, you can buy a physical copy or an ebook. What What are you calling it? I don't know if you all readers have got any suggestions for what <laughs> um, uh, buy it. Uh, let me know because I haven't um, I haven't got a final old title. I mean, I. When I pitched the idea to them, I called it the secret wealth advantage. Um, the idea being that if you understand the cycle, it's a tremendous advantage, but not many people know about it. Uh, but I, you know, I think we can do better than that. So uh, please do get your listeners to um, to write in with any other suggestions. If anyone's got suggestions, put them in the comment section down here. Um, thank you again so much, guys. Highly recommend everyone to subscribe to Phil's channel below to share this with someone that needs to see it and. To just get educated, it really isn't that difficult. Like you guys say this all the time and for people that are just coming across the information, it feels like a lot and then you hear the same thing repetitively from you guys for a couple of years and it just all starts to make sense. Um, What I've said to a lot of people that I've been speaking to is Phil and Akil sort of tell me this is coming nine months before it does and then Commonwealth Bank, West Bank, Bank, Macquarie Bank come out about three months later with a prediction six months before and then the Australian government sort of comes out with something about on time and then the media comes out about nine months later so it's a huge advantage by having just someone else's finger on the pulse that's so obsessive with this stuff um, like you guys are and like I am as well to just get ahead of the information and just to collect it and make better decisions earlier so thank you guys appreciate it you're welcome Cool, yeah. Oh, sweaty. So sweaty. <laughs>